Douglas Drake Onen is my name. I'm from Uganda Christian University, a student of law. Well, in analyzing this topic, I'm going to use seven words. I'm going to use the words of equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome. Now, in using those particular words in analyzing this topic, I will show you, I'll answer the, I'll answer the question in three different ways and later on go ahead and show you how we can solve this particular uh, problem of gender inequality and later on give you a cost benefit analysis of how uh, my solution works out. Well, understanding gender inequality, I would possibly just put it as gender, gender equality refers to the state in which access to rights and opportunities is unaffected by our gender or our sexes, which means woman or man can be in position to access all the opportunities without being uh, discriminated on their gender. Allow me to give you a historical framework of gender inequality in, th in, three, in three different prongs. The first prong is going to be re re the religious prong. The second one is going to be on uh, the cultural perspective. Let's start religiously. I'm going to look at the perspective of a Christian and Muslim. We have, but we have over 100 Bible verses that are against or suggest or foster gender inequality. And also we have verses in the Quran. For example, in the Bible, we have uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, that suggests that I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Uh, rather, she is to remain quiet. That's the first chapter. That's the first book in the Bible among the 99 others. How about in the Quran? In the Quran, uh, in the Quran uh, I think it's chapter 2, verse 228, it says that, Wives have the same rights as husbands have on them in accordance with the general known principles. Of course, men are a degree above them in status. Now, this particular religious perspective just brings to us a clear view of what gender inequality is enshrined religiously. Now, let me go to the, cult the cultural perspective. We as Africans, we often know, or as we grew up, we all know that we are in a society where women have been greatly discriminated. I know this particular topic will further foster basically on women, but later on I'll also bring out the aspect of the boy-child. But since we're talking about uh, gender, gender equality, it primarily centers on the women. Now, culturally, when growing up, all of us, uh, I grew up in a family whereby my mom is a housewife and my dad goes to work. So what does that mean? If my family is in such a particular state, how many more families are there like that that women are not given the opportunity to go out and have access to opportunities because of their gender. Now that's the cultural perspective that I would love to give. Now, what is the legal framework that we have in place? Now that will bring us to the first part of my analysis, which is equality of opportunity. Now, equality of opportunity, we have the legal framework set in place. Our constitution, the 1995 constitution provides in Article, in article 21, uh, pr provides for equality and freedom from discrimination. Now that is the legal, that's the first legal pr framework that we have in the constitution. Which other provision do we have in the constitution that provides for gender equality? We have Article 32 that, pro that provides for affirmative action. Now that is the legal framework. We have the legal framework in, at place. What does that mean? That as Uganda in answering the question of are there opportunities? Obviously the opportunities, the legal framework is already in place. But let me start by answering the other question of have Ugandans attained gender equality? Now, a report released by UN Women suggested that gender inequality continues to be a fundamental impediment to, to be achieved. Yeah? So in answering the question of have Ugandans attained gender equality, I would love to assert that no. Why do I assert that no? How, how, that we have not yet attained gender equality. However, we have made significant strides. Uh, we have made significant strides politically, socially, and economically. Now, that is the equality of opportunity that I'm talking about. Now, you have further a point more. of information. Yes. Uh, thank you. So, my question is simple. Back on your point of religion, uh, you said you, I don't want to bring the family aspect. My question is simple. Does the Bible govern your day to day life? Well, me as a Christian, I wouldn't again go against your question. Yes, the Bible governs my life and it's an authority, but since we're not in matters of discussing religion, I would stick to the topic of discussion today. So according to the 2018 Commission report on the status of women, the Commission acknowledges that all rural women and girls uh, face discrimination. And in Uganda, most of our population, 75% 75, 75 of our population is rurally based. Now what does that mean? that we people that are centrally 
are placed in rural cent in, in urban centers would not understand the, would not understand the effects of gender inequality that are in rural areas because of this. Now, in my discussion, I'll clearly bring out the political, social, the challenges that are placed, and then later on summarize with solutions and the cost-benefit analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. My name is Naluka Kerecheruth from Uganda Matters University in Kozi. So, me, I will begin by defining to us what gender equality is. Um, according to the gender glossary of terms and uh, concepts, gender equality is the concept that women and men, and men, girls and boys, have equal conditions, they have equal treatments, they have equal opportunity. Also, according to uh, UNICEF, the gender, uh, the gender action plan means that women and men, again, have uh, women and men, girls and boys, enjoy the same uh, rights, uh, resources, and opportunity. So uh, from, 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 from that, uh, I'm going to show you that uh, the concept of gender equality has been uh, pushed by inequalities towards women in Uganda. Uh, f back then in Uganda, Uganda is a uh, patriarchal uh, uh, society where we know that uh, men are more favoring, like a man is uh, the head of the family and all that. So from, from such a mindset, yes, of Uganda, we, 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 we get to know that that is where gender equality starts from. So uh, this uh, was broken in May 1962 when uh, the first uh, woman, the first woman MP joined uh, parliament, that was Florence Alice Lubega. She was the first uh, women, uh, woman to join parliament. That's when we saw different uh, organizations coming in to empower women because they had seen uh, that women are not involved in this thing. Then uh, another case is uh, uh, for the first panel, the first panel that we had here, there was only one lady, so is there gender equality? Even the second, in the second, is there gender equality? Uh, that brings me to the question. Uh, that brings me to the question. Has Uganda attained uh, equality? Yes, it has attained equality, but not to the, the equality that we actually need. Uh, let me you have a point of information. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, a matter of fact, I want to correct the speaker that when CCG was organizing this, it was a panel of two ladies and two gents. So the reason why we have one lady or two ladies on, pa on the panel, it zeroes down to the part of merit over gender. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you so much. Also to answer that is, uh, that, that, that I, I was going to bring that in uh, to show you that, uh, I was going to bring that in in the part of the challenges. Women uh, don't, don't come out like, to really stand out. That is where I was going to bring it in. Like, they, they, are, they do not uh, enforce, but yeah. Then, uh, then also, like, uh, uh, my stand was, uh, has, we have not yet attained. We, we have attained, there are steps that have been put there, but we have not attained the equality that we you actually need. You have the need. point of information. Thank you, madam. Now, in the light that you have said that women do not come up, do you then urge you in the line of affirmative action or on male? Pardon? Come again, please. In the light that you have said that woman, women do not come up, do you then urge you that the solution would be a affirmative action to address such a challenge or we should stick to male? Okay. Uh, maybe to answer that, I would say that they, they, they should put uh, different uh, sensati sensitizations, eh? like to, tell, to, to equip women to tell them that you can actually come up and uh, stand for even such positions. Uh, then to, uh, the reason why I say, to go back to my points, is the reason why I say that Uganda has not attained the equality we need is uh, the different... Uh, uh, political parties that we have in Uganda, all of them, all, most of them, the, their leaders are men. The, the NRM, we have uh, President Museveni. The DP, we have uh, 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 Honorable uh, 
uh, Robert Mao, DFC, uh, D, uh, FDC, sorry, we have Amriat. That, that, that shows that we have actually not attained the equality that we need. So even in uh, the economic status, the, the, the Uganda is, uh, the, the economy of Uganda is more sustained with uh, the men like us do. Uh, like, so that shows that we have not actually attained the, the equality that we need. Wow. Okay, maybe to, uh, as, uh, as a complete, uh, I would like to give uh, one of the opportunities. Uh, like, the first opportunity is like, uh, in Uganda we have seen because of gender equality, women have been given a chance. Senior six girls have been given a chance. And uh, they, they add 1.5 on... Uh, their results, so that that shows uh, because it empowers women. So that shows that there are steps that have been taken to actually attain gender equality. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. One, my name is Ngarano Titus, a final year student of polymer textile and industrial engineering from Busitema University. And today we are discussing the motion: Have Ugandans attained gender equality? What are the opportunities and challenges for gender equality in Uganda? First and foremost, my pre-speakers have given us a detailed definition of gender equality, but they failed to give us justification on how they're weighing the gender equality where Uganda stands currently. Currently, the current measure we are using to justify gender equality and gender inequality is a gender inequality index. A gender inequality index is a composite measure reflecting inequality in achievements between women and men in three dimensions. One, reproductive health. Two, empowerment. And three, the labor market, according to the World Health Organization and according to the United Nations Development Program. Now, in 1995, when we were drafting the Constitution, before the introduction of the affirmative action, the gender inequality index of Uganda stood at 0 0.651. To put it into greater context, you'll get realized that in 1995, the, the people, the share the share of seats in parliament in Uganda was 18.1, whereas that of men was 81.9, giving us a gap of 63.8%. Fast forward to 2019, we get realized that GII, which is a gender inequality index, for context, when I say GII, it is gender equality index, is currently at 0 0.535. You get realized that over the years, ever since the introduction of affirmative action, and I want us to be guided, affirmative action does not only state the addition of 1.5 points to the ladies, but also incorporates the introduction of evening classes and also incorporates the introduction of weekend lessons. We get to realize that all these, all these things were done, were, done, were done in order not necessarily to give women an upper hand, but in order to give us and attain gender equality at the end of the day. It is on this basis, therefore, that with Uganda's GII at 0.35, we get to realize that the world average of 0 0.436, we as a nation, we are not yet there, but we shall be there. And as if I put into comparison with other East African major nations of Tanzania and Kenya, with one of Tanzania at 0 0.556 and one of Kenya at 0 0.518, Uganda is doing favorably well. Moving forward, Uganda is a patriarchal society. Putting into context, it is a society that either favors the men or ladies as a dominant species. And putting Uganda into comparative, you get to realize that Uganda is predominantly, and we have the mindset that the men are supposed to govern us at the end of the day. Now, when I put the, now, moving forward to the part. You have a point of information. Yes. Uh, thank you. Now, that you argue that we are not yet there, but we are to get there, and in terms of affirmative action, do you believe that when we get there, we should scrap off the affirmative action? Yes, we think. Yes, thank you very much. In relation to the point of affirmative action, I would like to guide the fellow panelists and the House here and online that affirmative action was introduced in 1995 and given a time frame of 20 years. When you get realized that after those 20 years, most of these laws were supposed to be revised and adjusted. But to our decimal legislators at the end of the day, some of these laws haven't revised up, have not been revised up to date. Therefore, moving forward, I would like to state the context. I would like us to give an example of education. Now, according to a report in 2011 by Alice Mera Kagoda for the IIEP uh, school at Makere University, you get to realize that currently in Uganda, when you look at education enrollment, the enrollment of men 
in, in comparison to women is 50.1% is 50, 50 for the men and 49.9% 49, 49 for the ladies. But then that does not reflect in educational leadership. And now that is where the challenges begin to reflect at the end of the day. Now, if I, if I just give an example of educational leadership and I give an example of two universities, all public universities, that is Makere University and my very own Busitema University. Of the top management committee at Makere University, which is 10, only two are female. At, at Busitema University, of the seven top management committee, only two are female. You get to realize that even with the education enrollment, most of the challenges that are hindering some of these ladies to roll into the educational leadership as just a basis to give us a broader picture of what is affecting the nation at large. You get to realize that some of the challenges they are facing are structural barriers, multiple roles, transparency, society, and harassment. You should also note that one of the key hindrances of us as a nation is that we're a patriarchal society. As by us being a patriarchal society, we are already fooled by the by the point of bias on the ladies too, I would like to summarize in like one minute or less. Thank you very much. You get to realize that we are we we, we, we have this burden that we have that we have to <coughs> that we have to, we have to incorporate most of these things at the end of the day. Now of the opportunities, I will only list like three or four opportunities. Now we as a land generation, we can move Uganda forward too. Achieve, achieve, it, we also have programs that have been put in place to make Uganda a better place. The Uganda Women Empowerment Program, the Youth Livelihood Program, the Labor Works Program, and Social Assistance Grants for Empowerment. I would like to submit for now. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Oscar Manya from Kavali University, a very rural university in Kavali. And I'm here to make a case for the rural woman, a rural girl, a rural boy, without segregating. Now, before getting any further, I would like to say that this case I'm going to argue will also really tackle the issue that our Dr. Judge brought about the 17 billion addressed the mindset change. I will argue a case that shows you that gender inequality basically in Uganda is because of the society norms and conservative attitudes that we have in people of Uganda, and that if we address that, that will be the most sustainable solution to gender inequality. Now, why is affirmative action not a sustainable solution to gender inequality? I ask the question, if after 20 years, we achieve gender parity because of affirmative action, shall we then scrap gender affirmative action? And people said yes, because it was set for 20 years. Now, if it was set for 20 years, and we scrap off affirmative action, and then this was the very policy that was letting these women come up, letting these women take up position. Shall that then mean that if we don't have that policy, we shall thrive with the we shall thrive or we shall get back to the inequality? So that's why we need to address the mindset and the cultural norms and the conservative attitudes that we have in Ugandans so that after the affirmative action policies, we can have a sustainable gender equality. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before I go any further, let me define gender equality in a simple situation. And I believe that gender equality is an environment that prevents fair opportunities on merit to all people, regardless of who they identify with as female, male, or even we can bring in the other aspect of the LGBT because it is coming and we cannot do away with that. Thank you. So we want to look at how best can these people, regardless of who they identify as, will come up on board and actually get fair opportunities in all situations. Now, let me set the metrics because I'm being asked the question, have Ugandans attained gender equality? The metrics are simple. According to the UN, uh, the UN Women data, which uses the indicators perspective on uh, the sustainable development goals, uh, in February 2021, 42.6% were the only indicators that were available for Uganda to indicate gender equality. That means that there was about 54% of the indicators that are globally used that are not available in Uganda. And, if it, uh, and by that, we would argue that we actually have not attained gender inequality. But I don't want to argue the statistics way. I want to argue the qualitative way. Because if we go to the statistics, uh, like, like, <laughs> and like he said, 
In the recent Macquarie University graduation, for example, 51% of the graduates were females. But then, does that represent in our society? Does that show in the very uh, fields that we all love? Let us, for example, take STEM, science, technology, and mathematics, which is actually the future of this country. For example, if they are saying we are enhancing salaries of scientists, how many, salary, how many people or how many women, how many girls will benefit in the enhancement of that salary for that matter? It means that the education by the numbers is there, but are we going to the relevant field? Are we getting the quality of education, and which is very equal, regardless you of the You have point of information. Matter? Yes, I'll take that. Thank you very much. When you say 51% graduate, does, and then they do not reflect in the job market, does that answer the question of merit or gender equality? Which one of the two? Thank you. Thank you. My whole case about the 51% is that, yes, by numbers, we are there. But what about the quality? Which kind of people do we need? And where do, which kind of degrees are these people getting if we believe the future is stem for example like i gave you does that mean if you go to science sectors how many people do you find there now how does this bring the challenge that i already answered already which was you attitude have point and conservative norms thank you so much honorable with due respect you mentioned that uh, the future of this country is science and wherever so we are discussing gender equality are you trying to say those on the you. outsides are going to be marginalized once again? Thank you. Thank are you. Are human beings? Are these special creatures? Thank you. I didn't say arts are not important. Arts are equally important. But I'm saying that the, where we derive, where, where the future is headed. If we are here are discussing artificial intelligence, we shall basically see that we are progressing in science. And then the other thing is that we have already attained gender parity in arts. So what is happening in science that is stopping gender parity in science? That is the very thing that I'm trying to address right now. And this is the case. That some students, for example, I will need one minute. OK, thank you. That, for example, the example I was giving in, in science, that some girls in schools are not encouraged to take up mathematics, basically because of some all sciences, like he said, Sarantino, basically because the culture still believes that those are causes for men. People cannot do engineering because some societies still believe that they are those stereotypical kind of things. I will submit more in my next submission. Thank you, dear panel and the audience. Thank you so much. Titus Ogutu, uh, son of Ogutu from the mighty Kampala International University. On that point, the last one, culture. I will mingle you together with my brother, Drake who spoke about religion and culture. The first question is, he provided for us that Uganda has legal framework, 70%, to be specific, the statistics. Do these legal frameworks meet the cultural expectations of the societies that they are being put in? That is a question for you to think about. So if you, they do not meet the expectations of society, then they are useless, they are irrelevant. The reason why I asked Douglas why the Bible is useful in his day-to-day -day life, that is because religion uses the Bible. So if the Bible is affecting society, then we should do away with the Bible, since it was written by human beings. However, that does not discriminate or take away the point that you remain a Christian with the core principles of Christianity. Thank you so much. Now, to, get, to head to the next point, my brother said that uh, science is, is the way to go. I do not clearly understand. We are talking about gender equality. Gender equality is a human right. It's actually the mother of all rights. Okay? Then you're, 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 you're literally saying we are not discussing anything here. So we are discussing a diverse topic. Do not be limited to one field. To begin my presentation, Ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a discussion coming from a social point, a cultural point, a political point, and an economic perspective. Let's not be rigid on only one aspect of science. We need to have the fact that the world is developing at a higher space. An organic problem will always emerge at any given time. So when you come here and you say that we should actually prioritize scientists to have good incentives, then you should be prepared for the outcomes. Do not look at the process rather than forgetting the outcomes. My brother gave us here statistics of uh, Makere University graduating more women uh, less than, I mean, he was talking about gender parity. But does this translate in the quality of life we see today? 
I mean, we still have gender-based uh, violence happening. We still have gender inequalities in society. We still see girls raped. We still see teenage pregnancy. We still see child marriage. Have you gone to the root to know the challenges that actually society is facing before you make any point? Ladies point and gentlemen, my discussion, I will give him my last minute. Please relax. So my, my discussion or my concept comes a from a point of, okay, please. Thank you. You needed this right now. Uh, would you please compare the gender parity ratios in arts fields and science fields, and then you add you against my Thank point. you so much. You're not going to limit my beautiful presentation on arts and sciences. Thank you so much. So my discussion is on gender economic development. We are looking at gender economic development and this has to come from social aspects economic aspects and the political aspects now we all know that gender these are basically attitudes of whether you're either female or male and when you talk about equality you're basically saying that we should have an equal access to some of these opportunities now i have a problem i like to be real does uganda government provide sustainable avenues to create these successful opportunities that can actually see the thriving of gender equality as an ideology or as an idea. You will clearly understand that some of these ideas are just not embedded in the 1995 constitution, but they stem back from the American uh, Independence Declaration, from the French Declaration of Human Rights, uh, coming down to the Universal Declaration. And you need to be sensitive with the common sense of our age. When you look at the French Declaration, it says that all men are born free and equal. When you look at the United, at the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights, it says that all persons, you need to be sensitive that previously, yes, there was actually this biased mindset against the female gender. But there was only one problem. Why? Because the male gender was being filmed and point of put to the world. But the female gender remained on the other side and they did not clearly say. Yes, yes I'll thank take you. Thank you very much, fellow panelists. Uh, I would like to guide that Uganda has a framework and a body of policy that governs all these things. It's a Uganda gender policy of thank 2007. You, thank, you. Yes, yes. thank you very much. Thank you. I was coming there. So Uganda has the gender policy. Thank you so much for quickening my work. The question is to answer you, okay? The gender equality policies that continue to be put in place, or oh, those that you mentioned about, and the continued mismatch, when I say mismatch, I mean the continued gender-based violences or gender-based in inequalities that still exist in societies. Do we still need some of these policies? To answer your question specifically, we need to ask two questions. Why are some of these policies working, and how are they working? However, we shouldn't rush in addressing more policies just because we need to show the public that actually we are doing something about it. We need to ask ourselves, why is there still a gender pay gap? My brother, you know, the reason why I was running away from your discussion of gender parity is because you're saying arts and sciences. So when you pay more of the scientists and you don't pay the arts, and I'm imagining a family which has a man and a woman, and the woman is earning 50 million, and the nigger is earning 1 million. Are you OK? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The most decorated debater from my university, Sam, loves to call it the Harvard of Africa. Um, I want to start, first of all, by answering the question of the challenges that are presented. We've discussed data. We've discussed the figures and all that. They talked about affirmative action. I think the purpose of affirmative action is not to create a world where women compete for, with themselves, but to empower them and compete with the male. Today, 33% of the parliament is made up of women, something like about 188 MPs against 368 who are male. 146 of these around come as women representatives in constituencies where they compete with themselves. But a few of them come on the direct seat. So we can see that affirmative action is not achieving the purpose of giving women empowerment to compete directly with the male. It's either they are given a comfort zone where they do not actually think of moving out or they are not empowered enough. Because we should ask this question, does also representation 
tantamount to influence because you could be in a, a, a place we've seen the numbers grow we've seen the parliament grow bigger bigger every day they create new constituencies that, that means members are going to be many but how influential are they when we're making policies how 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 can they make their voices heard when you're making policies that is what we discuss when we, call, uh, when we talk about affirmative action. We've had the cabinet move from 27% to 43% representation of women. It's not yet 50. But you see, what positions do they hold? We, we always diss the position of vice president in Uganda. That is a ceremonial position. When we give them the key roles, do they have the power? Yes, they're going to say prime minister and all those. How many of those have, have we had to start discussing whether this works or not? We go to education. Recent data shows that 53% of girls aged 16 to 12 are reported to complete the seven years of primary education. Merely 25% of the females enroll for secondary school. When you bring affirmative action and take it to universities and add these people points and, and then introduce evening classes, the, don't you think there is a step you're missing? You're not hitting the target. Because what about these people that do not get to the position where they can enroll for universities? Yes, yes. thank you very much, fellow panelists, for that beautiful presentation. But a quick one. Do you believe that number translates to power? I, I, I started by asking a question. Power means influence. Does the number that we see in parliament, is it influential enough to you, for you to assume that the voices of the women are heard when we go to parliament, even with the affirmative action that you talk about? You people discuss universities, but you see, you, when you see a very big gap between the people who enroll for primary school, the girls who enroll for primary school, and those who get to secondary school, then there, are a very big, there is a very big number that we lose in the middle of the journey that is not accounted for anywhere when, when we are discussing the policies that are meant to bring the equality that we talk about. Um, the right to own property. I will discuss this in, 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 my, in, the, in the things I'm going to say next before I complete this question. That you see, women are majorly people in the villages who are employed by the agricultural sector and they only practice subsistence farming. For farming, you need land. That's where we talk about the right to property. Yes, our constitution has all this. And I'll say something before I continue. We have a very legal framework, a very good one. We, do, we are not in the fishes of law. But you see, this law does not come out. When we see the cases that are never completed in time in courts, when we see, because you, one can tell you, 56% of women in Uganda, aged between 15 and 49, reported to have experienced physical violence. And 22% of those have experienced sexual violence. But when you see the courts not handling their cases so well, because we also have a problem with the courts, it's either the case will not be completed on time, or you will see these women being embarrassed in court, because these cases are even very com complicated to win. The legal system is very complicated for them. How many of them can assess a lawyer to go to court and defend themselves whenever you have this? Because for you to have a good law, you must have a good court. When you have courts like ours, when you have a legal framework like ours, it's either you're going to, to, to alienate the vast majority of women from reporting the cases where they are, they, their rights have been violated, or you're going to give a go-ahead of the perpetrators to, to show, to, to be confident enough to do these things. After all, they're not going to be touched in any way. But that's what I was going to when I talked about rights to owning property. And that's where we discuss the land. But we have a problem with mindset. That even up to now, we believe when a girl is given land or in, to inherit land from their father, there are people who still think it's inappropriate. They still have this mindset that maybe women are inferior, that you're supposed to give that to a boy who knows the better use of it all. And then that's where we lose it. Five that, to wrap up. That's where we lose it. Um, I want to talk about the economy, where we miss it when we, 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 are, we are discussing this. When you live out women from, from getting the education, you lose it that you have a redundant labor force. You have to get taxes from these people, but you do not even get them because they do not work. There is a very big sector in the unpaid employment, and that is the women that we do not tax in any way, but they get services that they require, the health services and then the other things that government has to pay for. And then there is a very redundant workforce that we could make use of because human resource is, a fun, is fundamental time, for economic development. Up, One. The government of Uganda has to be very intentional when fighting poverty. 
You see, when we, see, when we look at societies that are very impoverished, we talk of Kalamoja, the northern region, that's where people are very poor. Those are the societies that violate women's rights so much. We've seen the role models in this country. You cannot tell me that people know that the speaker of this, pal of this current parliament is Betty Annette Among, a woman, and then they do not want to take their kid to school and be the same as Annette Among. But when people are poor, they look at these girls as some sort of commodity that they can give away anytime and get money simply because they are poor. When they see a 13 year old girl that they are spending on money seated at home but they can get married off and they get a million, that is why you lose it. So I think the government of Uganda has to know that there are very big challenges that are presented by the poverty and be intentional is a key word when fighting poverty. And then the other thing, I think we should embrace telling people that you see women can do these things. Take them to school and then use them as examples to change the mindset of people. When you have affirmative action, but then women can be there for all that they care. People become so big, somebody can become a member of parliament and still come as a, a woman representative of a certain, a certain district. They do not go to compete for the other. Let us use these policies the way they are supposed to be used to serve the purposes that they are supposed to serve. I, this, I think for now we should be discussing putting a term limit on this affirmative action um, uh, sits in parliament or even any other way that we, we, we give these people affirmative action and then go back and make sure students from primary education get the necessary education to come up to school because when you educate the people that's when you, you reduce a bias because even mindset doesn't even just come with you putting mindset change programs as, as some people will say but comes with you giving people the opportunities to go to school and know a life better than just that when they go and get married. Thank you. The scourge of teenage mothers during COVID lockdowns has been described as a pandemic within a pandemic. What can we do as a country to avoid the situation of a lost generation? Well, thank you so much. The first question is, what are the lessons that we have learned from the pandemic? That's the first question. One, Ugandans may say we were not prepared, but anyway, you have to be prepared any time. So, what were the causes of teenage pregnancy in the lockdown? One, they did not have access uh, to resources. Basically, the financial muscle was limited because we were under lockdown. And then secondly, I mean, parents did not have anything useful to do than even including, I mean, not, I don't mean useful to do, but like taking care or grooming some of these girls. They did not spend enough time with them. Children were just left around to loiter, go this one, go this. And some of them decided to put in their interest than the interests of their children. Because when you take a child to school, you should expect a lot from that child. Because uh, education limits uh, the, the chances that this girl might get into trouble. And one day, she will be a productive person. So I think we need to have a critical rethinking of when calamities happen and how prepared are we. So, and that is where the question goes back to the Ministry of Gender. What did the Ministry of Gender do? So, I as a person, I feel that some of these things can be best addressed if we have engagements. Because, I mean, we live in a country whereby the district, I mean, a district health officer is not even qualified to be a district health officer, may not have even qualifications. District education officers not even qualified to be a district education officer, just put there to enjoy that space. So what are some of these uh, initiatives that can actually hold on to the family? Because if you want to develop a family, then you must make sure that the family is at peace. And secondly, it must have a conducive environment of peace. Oscar, Oscar Kabale University. Oscar is representing the rural woman, so I would like you to tell us what progress, if any, you think Uganda has made in the quest for gender equality. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, for Kilalite, Tim Kavale University does not argue against arts, but it argues for gender parity across all fields. That is one. Secondly, my case is about the rural woman. We have made progress with the urban woman. For example, if you look at here, we have very many women, and that is because of the elite setting that some of them come from. So. Yes, there is progress for the elite woman, for the, for the urban woman, and my case for the rural woman is that we have not made enough progress. People in the, uh, in the, in the rural areas are still abusing the rights of women.
they still believe that women cannot do anything. That's why we are making a case for changing the mindset. The people there in Karamoja, people in deep rural areas of Chigezi are still st stereotypical that they think the, st the society is still patriarchal and therefore if, it, uh, if I'm arguing my case of rural women, we have not made giant progress until we address gender stereotypes. Ngabirano Titus, for you, do you think the urban woman has, we have we made progress? What is the status of the progress we've made in that quest for an equal world for men and women? Okay, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. And uh, to rush through the part of the urban woman, you get realized that uh, the way you classify an urban woman zeroes down to you in two aspects. An urban woman could be a person in the urban setting or could just be a person who is land but living in the, ab in the rural setting. It entirely depends on how you want to def define an urban woman. And basing on statistics, you get realized that the women when, when you consider a statistic in gender-based violence, you get realized that the number of cases of urban women reporting cases related to gender-based violence zeroes down to less than 30% as compared to over 60% in the rural areas. That is as per the UBOS report of 2019, the Uganda Bureau of Statistics. But then I would also like to hint on some of, the, some of, the, some of, the, some of what my fellow panelists said. One of Mr. Simon said that affirmative action needs time frame. You get realized that every policy designed bit by Uganda, we meant we tend to be so negative. But then beat Uganda or any country in the world, every policy has a time frame. Affirmative action had a time frame of 20 years. But then it was now back to the legislators to either, impl to either update the affirmative action and see what needs to be adjusted. One other panelist came here and talked of hypothesis. When you say that the person in the healthcare office is not necessarily is not necessarily qualified. You have to give us justification and at least an example to justify your statement. You cannot come here and give us an hypothesis and want us to base on it for the basis of argument. Now, my brother here talked about progress in gender equality, and I stated in 1995, as compared to 2019, when you consider the British the the Beijing platform of equality, that was in 19, I think, 80. You get realized that secondary school enrollment, both female and male, irrespective of religion, irrespective of region, jumped from 7.2% for female to 27.5%. Thank you very much. The lady, um, I would like to ask you the same question. What progress has Uganda made in the quest for gender equality? Okay, thank you so much. So. As, uh, as I said, the progress is there because uh, different frameworks have been put uh, for, for, for it to be there. Like uh, the, the Article 21 of the Constitution, uh, it, 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 it's a law that is, uh, which describes the status and the right of equal treatment. So that shows that we, we are somewhere and we have I attained, however, we have not reached to where we have to be. Then uh, women have higher uh, political offices in the current cabinet. We see uh, the Prime Minister, Honorable uh, Rebecca Nabanja. We, we see uh, 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 the Vice President, uh, Honorable Jessica Adupo. So that shows that we are there uh, compared to the former uh, parliament, which only had uh, 16 members, uh, women, M I mean, uh, 16 members, uh, but now we have 22 in parliament. That shows that we are there. Then the, the different, um, the, the different, uh, the different uh, things that have been put there, like political positions that have been put there specifically for women, like women MP. A woman and only a woman can come for such a position. So uh, that shows that uh, we are there according to gender equality. Uh, then uh, the, the increase in the number of girls joining, uh, high, uh, joining, uh, joining uh, the education sector, uh, it is uh, increased from, it is now on 5.33%. Uh, 5, 5 uh, according to the 2021 uh, 
the status quo. So that shows that we are there. Thank you so much. Douglas Drake, can you tell us about the scourge of the notion that the scourge of COVID-19 lockdown and, and the scourge of teenage mothers, sorry, was described as a pandemic within a pandemic during COVID-19 lockdown and what can be done to forestall that scourge? Well, it's unfortunate that COVID-19 came and led to high levels of pregnancies that were experienced in our communities. Well, people not going to school means there are other factors that are going to be involved, and yes, pregnancy was one of them. So the best solution that we, for as a country, we facing that particular uh, problem of pregnancy emanates from that. But we, you can't do away with the pregnancy. We have to deal with it. But then, now, what we have to do is the issue of gender, equ gender equality because these girls are still going to be discriminated in their societies because of the mindset. People are used to seeing young girls not being pregnant. But you go, you, if, if, let's say, a girl of 13 years goes to primary school and she's pregnant, she'll be discriminated. Now, how can we change that aspect of discrimination in that particular context? Everyone here, there was uh, a systematic overflow of how they intend to solve the issue of gender inequality. Well, my, my brother Tyatus on, on, on the other end brought out the idea of, you know, intentional fighting of poverty and the aspect of taking children to school. Well, we can fight poverty, yes, we can take children to school, yes, but why don't we do an overall uh, uh, sensitization of families? Because in a unit of a family, if we are to sensitize these families and have families deeply rooted and teaching families that women have the ability to be equal, women have the ability to also offer what they can offer. We have all talked about, all of us here have talked about equal opportunities, we, uh, equal, uh, equality of opportunity, that is representation in parliament, we have talked about, uh, we have talked about education, which is very good. But then on the issue of outcomes, my brother there also mentioned that over 50% of girls graduate annually, but they do not have opportunity. Now that, my, my issue of equality of outcome, if you have 50% of girls graduating annually, but then they do not have jobs, what is the issue? They come into the job bucket, but then there's a mindset problem that is with everyone. Now, how can, we ch how can we solve that problem? The issue is, without us not going to school, let us start with families. Because it's with the families, if we are to teach people how to respect women, we shall have uh, we shall have we shall have the, we shall have outcomes in society such as fairness such as uh, we shall have fairness we shall have health and happiness among people we shall have limitless possibilities Thank because you. people will have the opportunity to equally participate in spaces. Thank you, Mr. Onen. Rachel, I'd like you to answer the same question: teenage teenage mothers during pregnancy. What can we do to avoid the situation of a lost generation? Uh, okay. This one. Eh? The issue of teenage mother, mothers during COVID-19 lockdown and what can be done to forestall the situation. Okay, um, different uh, policies have been put in place uh, that actually advocate for women. We have uh, seen the Women Trust uh, policy uh, which uh, advocates for such. So uh, uh, for, for such a case of uh, uh, teenage pregnancies, uh, as, uh, as my colleague has said, it's uh, more of a mindset, yes, like a social mindset. We should first work on the social m mindset because it has already happened. We can't actually take it back. It has already happened. But how do we make these uh, teenage mothers also feel in place and uh, part of us, uh, like uh, the different framework I've, I've, I've given you. Then the, 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 the Health and Safety Act that, uh, the, the Health and Safety Act that provides for like each gender, uh, I, I think should also be put into uh, consideration because uh, with, uh, uh, with so doing, it, it, it will be uh, like it, with so doing, like it will be like uh, equipping for even those uh, other teen, teenage mothers. Then uh, we, there is a case in point where they only groom the girl child, and a boy child is not groomed. With we have seen different organisation like save the girl child, um, uh, girls not brides, uh, global girls youth uh, that only. Uh, that only uh, 
uh, sensitize women uh, and do not sensitize the boys. Do not uh, teach these boys uh, more ab about, uh, the, the do not teach these, these boys. Uh, if we, we see that if they are also senti sensitized, if they are also taught, probably we, we would overcome or like teenage pregnancies would be less. Thank you, Gabriano. Uh, please answer a question about um, how to eliminate existing gender biases in Uganda. First and foremost, the question is kind of, uh, someone might say a, a hypothesis, because when you say eliminate, you are being very unrealistic. What I would probably expect is how can we reduce gender biases in so Uganda? you're saying it's impossible to eliminate. That is, that is being realistic. Now, moving forward, now moving forward, uh, when, I s when, when, we are, when you are tackling the part of reduction of gender biases in a country like Uganda, may I believe we have to mostly and majorly focus on one strong factor, and that is education. A land generation can move mountains. Take an example of a student I would be very surprised when you spend over 20 years in school and you're the person d being uh, an aggravate of gender-based violence because all the education you have attained, it gives you the liberty to understand that me as a person, a woman is an equal and I'm not her superior, irrespective of the cultural norms, the patriarchal society we live in, or probably the things like that. Two, another key aspect that I think we should focus on as a nation is poverty. Irrespective of whether land or unland, the moment you are poor, you are driven to do things you'd regret doing at the end of the day. And that is even reflected when students are broke. Entitlement is that when I empower a woman to be an equal, it does not entitle you to govern me. You get, you get the context. So we sh even when the gender biases are on the road of elimination or reduction, empowerment and entitlement should not be confused and contradicted at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank my, my fellow panelists who have already done justice on what caused the teenage pregnancies. I will just go straight to how do we then avoid, the, uh, avoid going into losing a certain generation. First of all, as I had earlier told you, and as all the other panelists are buying into it, that the biggest problem of Uganda is about mindset change. And that is what we should address most. How does this come into this scenario, for example? Now, women or teenage girls who have gotten pregnant, the only way to empower them, all, if, if you asked all of us here, would be actually to empower them with education, to empower them with material uh, capital to help them uh, get empowered financially. But how do we then get to empower them with education, yet there is some stereotypical thinking out there that actually some schools are even holding that pregnant girls cannot study or they are chased out of school. So that's why we should start addressing that. If you get pregnant, do parents still believe that actually if a girl child gets pregnant, she still has value? Of course, no. And that is what we want to address as Dim Kavali University. Let us go back to the roots and educate the people that girls, whether pregnant or not pregnant, as still have chances and can develop and can actually come up. Let us go and tell the school administrators and policymakers in the Ministry of Education that a girl who is pregnant can also go to a class and is supposed not to be chased from a secondary school setting because yes, some th things happen and everyone deserves a change to do what? To recover. But the, the, uh, th those chances, the second chances, are always limited by that mythical beliefs, th those mythical beliefs that are actually not uh, worth it. Thank you so much. Uh, now, Ogutu Titus. Uh, your question now is about the progress Uganda has made in the quest for gender equality. No, no, no. Sorry, I asked you that question. Let's talk about what it takes to eliminate gender biases in our society. Yeah, to be corrected, you didn't ask me that, that question you just changed. So, uh, gender biases. Uh, this when, when we are talking about gender equality or anything to do with gender, it's not even a technical issue that we need experts. I'm still wondering why we still have the 75 million. What is it going to do? This is an issue that just needs 
uh, overall dynamics that comprise a society, okay? So when you talk about the biases, for example, let me give uh, an example of we, the gentleman. If a gentleman is walking and the shot is maybe cut and the new boxer is being seen, they will say those are typical, that's how boys behave, okay? But when the girl is moving in a funny way, they will say, look at how she's walking, you're spoiled, you know? So some of these unconscious biases need to be addressed, first of all. And when, when we, we need to address the structural inequities that do not amplify the voices of some of these girls and boys, you know? So we have these parents who think that actually some of their children cannot capable of doing certain things. And I think that is a backward mindset that we need to improve. So coming back to mindset, to be a little bit unique, you know, it's funny to sit here and look at you all and tell you that we need to change our mindset. What is mindset, first of all? Okay? So, when you are going to talk about mindset, let's start with the organizations that are going to implement. Let them have a productive mindset. You know, Uganda, we are too fixed to one thing. That's why we have so many policies. We are looking at them, singing about them, but they all symbolize to the international community that, yes, Uganda is doing well. We have a 44% cabinet. You know, we, we have a parliament with close to 34 women are there, but do these numbers even translate in the quality of life to the rural woman in Kabale here with my brother? So we need to amplify some of these structural inequities that do not amplify some of these voices to come out. Now, to, to speak about unconscious bias, I think the discussion is that gender equality should be correlated with equity. Let's have fair treatment between the genders, okay? So when, 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 because with equity, you're going to have access to equal opportunities the, uh, with respect to the differences between the two. I would really like to make a comment. I do not know if you just give me five seconds. Okay. Say, to resolve on the unconscious biases, we need to ask ourselves one question. A society that is going to maximize equal opportunities between the genders, what is the answer to that society? That society should maximize the choices of both genders. And to maximize both choices of genders, that society should be able to maximize the difference in choice of the genders. Five seconds. So, uh, okay. those two cannot move together, but they need to be taken into consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you, Titus. Simon, Simon, what progress has Uganda made in the quest for an equal world for women and men? I beg your pardon? What progress has Uganda made in the quest for an equal world for women and men? Um, I think Uganda has moved, has made some baby steps towards attaining the equality that we all want. Much as we advocate, okay, we can, we can point out the, the, some of the shortcomings of the affirmative action, it's still commendable that you have a fair number of women in parliament. It's still commendable that you have a 43% of the cabinet for females. It's still commendable that the uh, leader of government business in parliament is a female, the vice president, and then the speaker of parliament. It's very commendable. When you give the girls examples like these ones and show them that you can get there, people have, then you, you, you're really making a good step towards that. The universal primary education has given girls an opportunity to, to, to go to school and attain at least whatever they stop. They've, they've, they've given them that. I think the reason we talk about this thing is, is not so much to castigate the government, but maybe to point out where they've gone wrong. So I, I don't want somebody to look at what I've said in my first speech as a contradiction to whatever I'm saying today. We commend these things. There are girls that are at campus because of the, the points they give them. There are girls that are at campus because of the evening classes. They can do their other things and then return. Then Uganda has also tried and moved some, some good steps towards abolishing some of the, the cultural practices that were against girls. I think we, we, we have put that energy into that, and as, long as, as, as much as it's not enough, we can at least say they've, they've made some baby steps. Okay. You are done. Thank you. I'd like you to answer the same question. What progress has Uganda made in the quest for an equal world for women and men? Back to what I said. Equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome. Uganda has made some strides. However, globally speaking, gender equality is still a fundamental 
impediment towards human progress. So Uganda making some steps means we have spaces or we have representation, such as in Uganda. In, in 1962, we had only two, we only had two women in parliament, and as opposed to the current 120 plus women representatives in parliament. Now that shows that we have made some tremendous steps. That shows the equality of opportunity that we're talking about. Looking at other spaces as well, economically, women are CEOs, women are running businesses. That shows Uganda has made some progress. However, looking at the, looking at the equality of outcome, if currently we have, in my university, even many universities, women constitute majority in, in our lecture rooms. What does that mean? The boy, child is, the, the boy child is now actually in class, there are fewer. The women have got the opportunity to attain education. And, and yet, when they come out of universities, 50% do not get the employment opportunity. You know, human rights approach to development looks at participation, looks at accountability, looks at non-discrimination and all that. Now, if all these women come, if all these girls come out of school and do not get employment because of the gender equality issues, like sexual harassment, among others, then the issue of equality of outcome comes in. The issue of us, the mindset that is in the society. Because if the mindset of people are in a particular way held bent that women are this and that, then, the, then we need to come up with a solution, of which the solution that I provided was. The first important thing we need to do is focus on families. Families are the smallest units in the community that would help bring up, bring up children that would, for generations, bring what for generations look at gender equality. Because we're not only looking at short term. You can get the education, we do agree, get the education, fight the poverty, but we need to look at the smallest units of the community, and that is the families. So if we solve that, then we are, we are going to make very tremendous steps. However long term it is, for the future generations to come, we would, we would have done our part as the present generation and made good steps. So back to the question, Uganda has made some progress, but on the other part of equality of outcome, we need to do much on that. Okay, please stay with the microphone and answer your last question for the session. What would it take for Uganda to eliminate the existing gender biases? It still brings me back to my, still brings me back to my, my, my solution, family, you see. When I come here, um, I, I, I subscribe to the sociological school of thought that society progresses and in a progressive society, we have people that have minds that, you know, are able to take in things in a positive way. Now, in this 21st century, uh, we have mindsets, or we, have, we still have mindsets that still, uh, still discriminate against women. So, the, first, the, the, the solution that I offered, one, was the issue of what? Family. So, in us enabling or us uh, sensitizing families and making families uh, remove away that particular mindset against women, that will make us go a very tremendous uh, step towards elimination. As he said, he wouldn't go with, with the idea of elimination because it's impossible. But uh, as I said, I subscribe to the sociological school of thought. Progress can be made and actually we can actually attain gender equality. I would love to believe so with the smallest units of the, fam with the, smallest units of the community and that is family. So if we set on those families, focus on the families, have the mindsets of kids that are growing up changed, take them still in school and teach them the same, then don't you think we are going to have a community that is equal? Because that is what we're looking at. And lastly, something that arose, um, I am a boy child, and it saddens me if I'm in a university whereby the boy child are no longer being positioned to get into universities because girls have the 1.5 weight. And because me, I, I cannot maybe attain the particular point, and I do not have the particular weight, and I'm left out because I do not have that. The topic of discussion today is gender equality, regardless of sexes. I want us to eliminate the idea of only women. Boys are also there. So if we are to discuss gender equality, we look at both the women. I know the women are the most marginalized, but in a progressive society, we are going to solve this problem five steps forward. The boy child will be neglected ten steps backwards. So let us also put that in point. Uh, what would it take for Uganda to eliminate the existing gender biases? Okay. Um, first of all, as uh, Simon had said, there are already some, uh, there, are, there are policies that have been done 
yeah, some policies, uh, a policy of uh, the 1.5, adding on the girl, then uh, the other policy I said of uh, uh, specifically giving women positions in uh, the parliament, like women MPs and all that. So what should Uganda do to eliminate this gender biases? First of all, I think we should, uh, Uganda should work on the different cultural uh, practices that uh, actually there are different cultural practices that blind women to be subordinate. Uh, for example, the local, uh, the local marriage counselors in brackets and guys, where they uh, still tell uh, ladies that it's okay for a man to actually beat you and uh, harass you and uh, you move on. Uh, campaigns should be put against this so that uh, by so doing, we shall be uh, eliminating uh, gender equality. Then uh, the gender equality today is uh, now as more organizations have come up to fight for the uh, girl's sex, now we realize that uh, uh, the boy gender is being left out. A boy would find it hard to come out and talk in publicly, that, like talk publicly that uh, they were sexually harassed and uh, they would even uh, society perceived it, perceives that as a, a very shameful thing. Yet uh, they can also be publicly harassed. We do not see uh, any act in the Uganda Penal Code Act that uh, is, talks about that on the side of boys. There is, uh, boys, the, let me finish, there is no account, there is no law that talks about rape on the boys' side, yet they are also, uh, so like to, for us to, to, to uh, come out, for us to eliminate gender equality, for, uh, for gender equality to be worked on, at least a policy or a law should Thank come Thank you, up. Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Titus, your last question for today is about teenage mothers that your mothers are doing lockdown. What can be done to forestall the situation? For starters, is uh, have we embraced the teenage mothers, yes or no? And the answer in very many contexts is a no. So what we should first do is embrace the teenage mothers who have already been there. Now, as I said, we have a patriarchal society and is also very much driven by bias. You get to realize that even at university, when students see a female lady pregnant, they become so judgmental. Now, with that already in mind, are we embracing the teenage pregnancies? Two, we are not losing a generation. It is our minds that are losing a generation. Because if you have a child and you have decided to keep the child, what justification do you give me that I'm going to lose a generation just because a teenager gave birth? It zeroes down to mindset. And at times, some, these are some of the things that make us need that 78 million in the budget for mindset. Because people at the end of the day fail to interpret and comprehend issues in, in, a, more and in a more free state. Because I believe that if a girl child is already pregnant, either willingly or unwillingly, of having sex with somebody below age. I think government should embark on a very serious operation and have these people arrested and taken to court. Even the people who help them, the mothers of these people who call these people for engagements to give them money should be taken to courts of law and they should be reprimanded for what they've done because it's a very big crime. Number two, we should talk about reproductive justice and the affordable contraceptives to these girls. If we can have these people make decisions on when and how and which one contraceptive they want to take so that we can avoid these things to continue, at least let's have that. I think we have a problem with our health system where somebody goes to get contraceptives and they'll be asked, when did you start? Why are you even doing this? But of course, these things are going to happen. These people are going to find themselves in such type of of scenarios. So give them those type of, of contraceptives and at least reduce the number of things that happen. And then um, I think, sorry, and, and then about, he distracted me a bit. Um, I have comprehensive sex education. Tell these girls because you see they do not have the much needed um, 
uh, information and they get it from these men. Tell them what exactly it means to have sex, the consequences of doing that, and let them be in the know, not to learn from people who want to get what they want to get from them. Thank you very much. Make it so dangerous for anyone to even dream of having sex with a young, a young girl. Yachisache from Uganda Matters University in Kozi. So I believe my question goes to KIU University. I mean, Kampala International University. Women and men are naturally endowed differently. So do you think we have some natural barriers to gender equality? And how can they be combated? Thank you. Thank you. For okay, thank you. My name is Fraser Natsinguze from Kabale University. And my question goes to, to our lady from Uganda Matters University. Yes, she talked about the 1.5 that is added to girls at the end of senior six, and she says it is meant to empower women. What are we talking about? If I'm not mistaken, we're talking about equality, right? And equality in a layman's understanding means a state of being equal in maybe status, rights, opportunities, and all that. So why don't, if we really want equality, why don't we be equal other than letting others be on another on another level compared to the others. Because if we really want to be equal, let the boys as well be given the 1.5, or it is scrapped off for both of us. Thank you. This is Omanya Abdu, and I'm from Kumbo University. All right, um, my question goes to Titus. First of all, I would like him to define what mindset change is, and what he actually means by that. And then secondly, to the panelists altogether, at what point do we say that we have attained gender equality? because you did not set for us the metric. Thank you. Cavendish University. Uh, at the beginning of your presentation, uh, Ogutu Titus, son of Ogutu, that was a, a rather a very good presentation, but I had an issue. Uh, you mentioned, quote unquote, uh, that the Bible is one of the causes of stereotypes and gender inequality. I don't know uh, which information you have, but according to, to the Bible, uh, and in Genesis uh, 5, chapter 5, you say that he created man and woman, and he created them in, uh, in his own image. And in various chapters, we see that actually women are, are commended for their good work that they have done, uh, not to mention uh, Phoebe, uh, Eunice, Mary him, uh, herself. So on what basis would you make such an outrageous uh, remark, which I actually find very naive? Thank you. Representation and numbers. And if we are to look at the gendered aspect of violence in Uganda. How can we say that, how far has gender equality come? If I look at the cases of uh, defilement, rape, uh, gender-based violence, domestic violence, and the extent to which they are prosecuted in the courts of law, to what extent in those terms have we achieved gender equality in this country? I am a pharmacy student. Um, I, I have, of course, it, it, the conversation has really confused me when uh, the, I think the first speaker came and defined equality and talked about equal conditions, and then the conversation went on to herald 1.5. I, I really want to understand the equality there. But um, one, I think it's her who, who asked the question and said that, is that really equality? But then I want to ask a question to all um, the panelists. Should we go for equality and forget merit? Because when we look at some of the women that we are heralding have gone up, um, I said I'm a pharmacist and so I'll speak from the health, Ministry of Health. All the top officials, the minister, um, the permanent secretary, minister of state are women. Has the corruption decreased? Our, our, our prime minister, our vice president, I mean, we have so many great women at the top what has that equality done for us? Should we close our eyes to the benefits of merit and just say, Bambi, they are women? Is equality a question of sympathy or merit? I would want that to come out clearly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Narada Tracy, KU University, and I'm a law student. So my question goes to the panelists that gave education as a solution to some of the issues that we have concerning gender imbalance. Is it really the solution? Because we see that despite different men being educated, we see that there's still th these inequalities or these mindsets that they have towards women. And we also see that despite the fact that certain women are educated, 
they still see men in a certain way. For example, we see so many of us girls still think that we can't maybe do certain jobs or be in particular places, or it's the man to provide for me, it's the man to do all these things. So is education really the solution? Or, okay, something of a sort. Thank you. Uh, doing Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering. And um, I will applaud uh, the panelists uh, for uh, seeing out uh, the solutions. Uh, I heard some saying um, sensitization and uh, is it Douglas? Uh, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the mindset well. And my question is, uh, and it's going to all the panelists, uh, it is um, if you have the opportunity uh, to advise the government, would you go on to advise the government to allocate the money that was mentioned earlier that it allocated for mindset? Would you uh, advise the government to do so? And if so, how best would you advise it, would you go further to advise the government to best uh, use uh, to put that ma uh, ma uh, uh, money allocated to the best use such that um, uh, gender balance, gender equality can be attained. Thank you much. Um, Mikai Maureen from Uganda Pentecostal University. My concern is, uh, as far as Uganda is concerned, I think the right and empowering is to everyone. And now my question is, how best can we zero down the song of empowering women? I think women are already empowered. So how can we zero it down? Every time we have a discussion on equality, it seems to boil down to, economic, uh, to political participation. And going by our current statistics, of course, numbers wouldn't lie, and we seem to have a larger number of women uh, involved in politics. However, I would like to ask a question specifically. When you zero down to political uh, participation is what you're doing is taking just a tiny substrata of the demographic and focusing on that. But what is the social and economic impact at household level of uh, gender equality or its lack thereof? Do we actually have equality or the illusion of it? Are we uh, empowering women if we do not empower them economically? Thank you. The opportunity. Mine is just a comment. Um, I think this debate uh, should have started from the foundation of uh, gender. So we all understand that there's a distinction between sex and gender. So sex tends to inform gender. Sex is biological. Gender is a social construct. So upon what stage do we choose to say that gender equality is achieved? That's a very good question. But that question needs to be informed by the fact that gender is a social construct. So whenever you talk about solutions such as education, questions such as uh, let's uh, have strict laws, the way how we teach our girls, the way how we teach our boys to grow up is as a result of society. So I think that this discussion also ought to have had the gender influences that come with, uh, with, with gender equality. We can't seem to look at this debate from a perspective that does not include aspects of how we train our people to grow. So I think that that's an aspect that was really, really important in this debate, starting from the foundations, knowing what a professor such Thank as you. Tamale have said in as regards reconstructing society and its gender implications. There are a couple of questions. If time catches me and I've not answered your question, you forgive me. Let me start with the first one. At what point do we say that we have attained gender equality? Um, Iceland is one of the countries that is the best country in terms of gender equality. And the metric they used is they have a, they have a, a women representation of 40% 40, 40 in parliament. They have not yet actually yet attained gender equality, but they're considered the best. So at what point as Uganda are we going to say that we have attained gender equality? As in my submission I said we have made tremendous steps. We have the legal framework in place. Now all we have to do is the, the biggest issue at hand is the, the, the matter of mindset. Once that is fixed, then now the other metric of gender inequality whereby women can therefore have the representation, women can therefore go ahead and, uh, go ahead and have the, the opportunities of education, but also do not forget that in attaining gender equality, we should also put in mind the boy child because we're looking at equal access uh, to rights and opportunities of both genders. So at a particular point where Uganda can say we've attained gender equality is where we have equal representation, equal opportunities which we haven't yet reached there. Two, to what? No, Rachel. Uh, so a question arose about the one 
uh, point five point. And uh, in my submission, I told you the concept of gender equality has been pushed uh, in inequalities toward women, especially here in Uganda. So that's why uh, we see that 1.5 uh, uh, given to the, uh, the girl gender and uh, actually not given to the boys because the inequality has been pushed more to the girl gender. So hope I've answered you by that. Then the next question was, at what point uh, ha have we attained gender equality? My stand was uh, we have attained uh, we haven't attained the gender equality that we actually need. However, there are uh, solutions and steps that have been taken, uh, uh, different steps that have been taken uh, by the law that have helped this uh, aspect of gender equality to Time be up, achieved. Yeah. Peruse through these questions very fast. First, the gender equality ma matrix, I stated it very clearly in my submission, unless otherwise I'll just repeat it was the GII, the gender inequality index. Two, the 1.5 wasn't introduced for, it wasn't introduced for equity, it was introduced for equality. Ladies and gentlemen, let us depreciate gender equality and gender equity. Moving forward, when you, when you want to compare the context of equality and merit, most of the women in those high positions have attained those positions via merit. And some of the things hindering this is also how, how is the, case, the challenges we face. Four, quality of education is very key when some of the men out there are still being, are still being perpetrators. Then also mindset money. Mindset money, we should trust the process, and I'm very sure they will deliver. And also the part of empowerment, Empowerment is done to, uh, to, to bring us to a point of gender equality, not gender equity. Let us depreciate equality and equity. I remain Gavrano Titus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oscar. Thank you much. First of all, I would like to uh, let you know that Team Kabbalah University still argues for sustainability and a feasible plan that will last for long, that is addressing gender stereotypes. So equality versus merit is actually uh, sympathy. Those people attained out, uh, out po those positions out of sympathy because we argue that affirmative action is actually sympathizing. That's why we argue that we address the mindset and we let all people compete favorably uh, and society can believe in the girls too. We also, argue, we also gave you solutions to how education can be uh, a solution. We said we should... Uh, put policies, educational reforms, and uh, curricular activities that actually encourage gender studies from the lowest uh, level. We talked about, um, someone asked about gender being defined as only sex. I think that was not true. We defined gender, even referred to the LGBTQ and the PWDs. I hope uh, that gets clear. As I conclude, let us address mindset change. Let us empower uh, girls from the grassroots and let us tell the society that people can do the same at Thank all you. times. Thank you. My sister there mentioned something about the male and the female. There is nothing so special about us, probably the biological factor of one being a man or woman. But in reality, we are all equal and we are entitled to equal opportunities. Hope you understood my words. I also want to apologize to my brother. I'm sorry for hurting your feelings. But the reason why I mentioned that point was because of my brother Douglas. You realize one of the reasons why the domestic relations bill hasn't been successful up to now is because of religion. That is because of the conflict between the Sharia law and the principles uh, uh, that the Christians hold. Because the Christians say, marrying more than one woman is infringing on my dignity and integrity. However, the Muslims say that you're dealing with a car, uh, with, with uh, I don't know, a, a spiritual arrangement, if we are to say, or a godly arrangement that Christians cannot understand. And of course, the Muslims also accuse the Christians that, look, you preach Christians, just as I finish, I want to be clear, that you preach Christian values, however, we see you having official wives and unofficial wives. If I had enough time, I would have explained you to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think most of the things have been responded to, but about the question of whether education is really the solution, we did not mention that there is a silver bullet or anything alone is that one thing to solve 
the pro that's why everybody was mentioning what they think, and I think we've mentioned so many things. If somebody has gone to school and probably they think they're still in failure, then maybe being the, like the mindset, and then they talked about those things. Then somebody said that we zeroed, this we zeroed the debate to participation. I think politics is a very big issue. It influences every other aspect of life, the policies that people make. So we have to involve women in making decisions and the policies that affect them. You cannot leave the monkeys to decide issues of the forest. The men are usually indifferent when it comes to this, so I think when we include ladies in participation and policy making, I think we can get to where we want to be. And then lastly, um, about the equality or the 1.5, I, I, I beg we, we know when it is reparation and when we are trying to disadvantage the men against the women. Okay, thank you very much. And a, a round of applause for these uh, gentlemen and ladies. There is already a gender issue here. So, <laughs> lady and gentlemen. And I come back to the same issues because I know they are key for you. Take them away, be my representative wherever you go and talk about these things. Because if you give me a chance, and I could even ask all of you, what is the basis of your conviction to start debating this topic? Because I wanted to see each one every one of you have a basis of their understanding. Because that's how social discourse proceeds. It's not best, if we are to call this a national debate, then it must underpin those issues. Who do you think a woman is to you? What do you believe? Then on the basis of that, you start discussing. I, I keep seeing this and, and people just, ah, you are wasting time coming. Uh, stop uh, disturbing us. For us, we are, we are in the game. And I'm not surprised that there are women at parliament, no impact. There are women in what? Just uh, going around. Uh, but I have just been telling my colleague here that maybe let's give chance. Who knows? Uh, something could come out. You never know that on the basis of things that undermine women, who knows? A woman in parliament who's paid the salary could uplift their daughter, and their daughter could now begin participating usefully. Who knows? And so for me, when I was listening to you, I wanted to hear you talk about economic participation of women. I wanted to hear you talk about decision making and quality decision making. I wanted to hear you talking about valuing different behaviors and aspirations and needs equity between women and men. But that had to be based on the foundation of your thought process. It's called school of thought. So as future debaters, I challenge you, what is your school of thought? Because this is the problem I find. Like the people who are saying mindset change, I just wonder, what is a school of thought? Is it materialism or is it foundationalism. Because look, we have schools, we have families, and if you have to impact for postality, you must utilize those institutions to change the status of men, women, and girls. If you don't, you risk providing money for political disorientations. You have come with a pot belly and you are walking around, and then you are telling me to be slim? Are you serious? That you need to eat healthy? Is it serious? So you must deal with the fundamentals. And that's, that's why I, I, do these people have a school of thought, or they are just affected by materialism? And it doesn't matter whether you are bright, dull, or what. This is why I advocate, and I have been advocating, John knows this, that it is important to introduce philosophy philosophy, and I mean philosophy, to primary school kids and secondary school kids, so that we can see this brightness. You are very bright. Come out in its originality. Because otherwise, you see, you, you'll find 
let me use this. Someone used it, but I used it in, I used it in good faith. Useful idiots. By saying useful idiots, I'm saying very bright, smart people being deployed to pedo propaganda. Why? Because they do not have fundamentals in terms of school of thought and what they believe their one being should represent. I, I am sorry. I'm sorry to... So I am going to challenge you. What is your world view? What is your world view? Including you. Before you debate anything, establish your world view. What you are willing to die for. That even when you change a bit, you don't change fundamentally. That that does not affect your flexibility. And that even when you flex, the fundamentals remain the same. I challenge you. You are young people. You are founding this country. This is why I keep calling you back to the Pan-African, the long sung song of African women, for example, here, who are not properly founded. Look, I, I am, I, your story show was short, but very important. Look at the teacher. The teacher say, oh, mommy, if daddy buys it, gives the money to mommy. See this distortion. Total distortion. And so, equality, is it about numbers or is it about equal opportunities? You have numbers. Patriarchal, matriarchal, what are you talking about? Power with men, power. that doesn't matter by the way. It doesn't matter. But how do they use this power is what is important. It's what the young child should know from the beginning. That it doesn't mean if you have power, you use it against them. That's what I wanted to hear from you. And finally, and, and this is where we go, and the, the young people, what, why I criticize, why I will, and I will always criticize this money for mindset change. Very archaic, very backward. If you have a political philosophy, a political philosophy means politics of ideology, then social programming is part and parcel of that ideology. What does that mean? That you have components of philosophy, of politicking, that impact education, that impact society worldview, that impact arts and culture, that impact the politics of the time, etc., etc., meaning the politics of resource allocation also go to fundamentally underpinning those issues that found society. And that's what we call, to some extent, social programming. I can understand you. Good news. That when you have a pandemic, even a social pandemic, like corruption, uh, battering of women, undermining of women, maybe that's when an intervention is needed. So if you are going out once to tell people that, wait a minute, if this pandemic does not, is not contained, we are going to die, I allow that money for mindset change be deployed, but not as a matter of ideology. I thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Great. Uh, what a debate. I must say uh, you people have equally done a good job uh, comparing uh, the discussion of the morning session and this one here. Uh, I must say that this debate would have been better if there was a balance in gender, three, and three on the other end. We would have a uh, sort of a match uh, in terms of uh, content that will be raised. Um, one of the key things that I've noticed is that uh, <coughs> your focus was more on the equality element. There is what women are advocating for lately, which is equity. How many of you have uh, learned of the women's movement? The Ugandan one. Do you know it? Yeah? You left it out? So those are the foundations of women, equality, and the demand thereon. We know the likes of the Maria Matembe, the likes of the Winnie Bianima. They fought for this. They put in so much effort. So it would be very important to take note of the progress that we've made compared to what we have now. I've been blessed to join a team of experts to develop a strategy for one of the leading women organizations here and they are changing the strategy. They are looking at equity rather than equality. Equality is just verbose for 
advocacy and all that. We want equality, we want to be equal, we want this. But there is what we call equity. Equity in that it, it goes beyond the equality. You hear me? So th those are the key things you need to look at to see that at least whereas we are looking at equality, which is uh, enshrined in some of our laws, they are merely, you know, like uh, Dr. Dewey says, well, give them a chance, let it be there. But the women are doing more. The women are looking for equity. So for these people here, the group of uh, the organization, they are looking at something different from what the women organizations are doing. I just wanted to ask two questions to two of you. Busitema. Who was your founding vice chancellor? Who? Thank you. Kabale. Who was your founding vice chancellor? Did you hear that? Thank you. I just wanted you to know that uh, those two universities were founded by women. Much. Um, I'm deliberately putting on my jacket because it was supposed to be um, point number one. Um, I wanted to ask, but I know we are running out, out of time. So I deliberately put on a bow tie today to appear different, to seek attention, to be smart, to honor the occasion. But most importantly, I knew that if I were going to be a panel of, say, arguably three, it's a bit crowded, um, I will sharply attract a sense of focus from an imagined person who arrives in. Just a trick. You got it, guys? So while Dr. Kamunyu gives the detail, like the teacher, I'm giving you the, the beef of the trick. Um, I think uh, one of the finalists in the morning said they lost out an opportunity in, in meeting with us. The first presentation I talked about part of my background that I was a chairperson of a debating club in my primary school and I was chairperson in P6. Now, that's a bit of a trumpet blown, but to do so at primary six showed I had something to give. So guys, you really have to make sure that one, you have something to give, be convinced that you have something to give, and definitely give the something that you have. So we were saying as judges that past, possibly this time around, this panel was slightly a little bit lack, lackluster, and we're wondering, what is it? And we thought, well, generally, you are yourselves. You cannot be anybody else. Um, but you basically need to put a little bit of uh, energy. But number two, um, I think uh, Mama has started with what was going to be my last point, and that was the point about uh, leadership. And for Busitema, uh, I was just going to hail you that uh, Aunt Mary Okwakol was actually one of the two most influential women leaders at UPC Women's Desk in the early 80s in the last UPC administration. Now, these were women influencing, directing, and pushing policies and programs away from the structural representation. But this is women getting involved and participating and translating. And that's why it's extremely important that, yes, we must educate women, we must involve women. And the legitimate question, which really must be, have been part of the debate, is that what are the women who are in position doing to push for all other women in society, structural, but qualitatively ensuring that really what a woman really, really needs, including girl-child, is a matter of policy. And so I thought that 
we did not you guys did not address the leadership gap. The fact that this is a structural issue. The fact that you guys were referring to policy and basically listing it down there. I know one or two of you guys challenged it. But yes, how do we translate this into practical realities that go? I think one or two of you guys talk about it. Um, um, the maternal deaths, these deaths in hospitals, uh, um, uh, women struggling to give birth. I know some of you guys gave the obvious things about uh, 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 access to, uh, to seasonal parts and things like that. Not in passing. The realities who talked about, uh, some of you guys talked about charcoal, which is going to be in my column on Sunday. Um, the women struggling to basically access water, access to water education. The holistic thing, the thing that, well, at the end of the day, when the, uh, those watching us away, look, and our mothers and, and sisters and aunties are saying that, yes, the guys debating the future leaders have really got us at heart. And if we gave them the opportunity the next five years, as we promised in Parliament, they're actually going to be the guys who are going to be the fundamental policy uh, changes. So... Quickly, um, I would wrap up in this way. As I said earlier, you need to make sure that while you're debating, you have the depth, the evidence, the research. Surprisingly, none of you guys mentioned, none of you guys mentioned that UPC, my party, has produced two women leaders. <laughs> Cecilia Gual, Cecilia Gual between 1990 and 1996, was effectively the president of Uganda People's Congress. Now, that was the only then leading political party. I'm not making political points, but I just want to tell you, you need to recite these things because you need to put it on top. Mama Miria was president of Uganda People's Congress. Uganda People's Congress, one of the independence founding parties on Africa, in Africa. So that's a powerful thing that Uganda, you need to clap for it. You know? So you missed that. <laughs> so, so is it about progress? No, it's about women representation. Is it qualitative? It, it is. Even up to now, I'm actually challenging some of the leaders inside UPC on the basis of some of the whatever challenges are taking place. What did you do when Mama was president and you're a member of the cabinet? I happen to have been a young member of that cabinet at the time. So these are the things. So we need to make sure that you guys don't only debate. You debate, go get jobs, change lives, change your lives, change communities, and we change this nation. We change the continent of Africa, and definitely we change the lives of the girl child. Critical thinking, I totally concur. You guys did attempt as a group, and in fact, it has been very difficult as I give the final results. Um, Titus, um, yes, you, 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 you happen to refer Titus Bositema uh, to Auntie Mary and indeed McCary that 10 of the 10, there are two women. Of the seven, there are two women. You are going into the details. Those are the things, but qualitatively, yes, what really are the realities on the ground? What about the academic and teaching staff? What about the cooks? You know, what are the, then? Um, th those are the kind of things that we expect you to, to be able to, to, to have referred to. But generally, um, we believe that uh, you did uh, a generally a good work. And if we look back to where, where um, it's an improvement, just simply avoid generalization. Um, somebody was talking about education and was saying that uh, education versus gender and uh, men and violence and no this is not a chart down the river this is a national students debate and it's actually a national competition and it's one which must as i said again be based on evidence overall well done guys and as i said uh, my remaining task is to say that uh, you were exercising um, somewhere somehow two people will have to emerge out of this group uh, uh, to go and uh, present the youth interest in the next session. And those two uh, happen to be. Congratulations to everybody. Uh, but by the way, just a another th 30 seconds. Whereas the other group was a very, very tough, powerful group, so we thought. Here for me as a judge, um, with the exception of maybe a particular individual, I could easily have said, like we're saying, all of us, we wish we could take you guys all to the next round. But just happens to be one person, one, one or two person have got to go. So no, uh, you've been generally good, but up your tempo. Your tempo is less than where the other guys were, but you're generally a fantastic lot of guys. So just to say that uh, the two guys who happened to go to the next round, somehow, coincidentally, it was not my choice in that way I'm wrapping, 
is Titus and Titus. <laughs> Simon. Sorry. Someone, just a quick thing. When I was talking about my tie, um, Garang was casual smart. Yeah? Garang was casual smart. Fantastic. Simon, you're casual slightly below the expectations for a national debate. But you're very smart for a casual Sunday uh, or af afternoon somewhere. But for a debate, j just a note to take because you're a fantastic debater. But just to say that uh, that's a feedback you need to have. As in all is good praise. Well done. And congratulations once again.